Welcome to the Terminal Value Podcast. I have John Rossman with us today, and we're going to be talking about continuous digital innovation, the Amazon way. And uh, so, oddly enough, this corresponds with the name of a book that John authored. Uh, but the, the, the topic that we really want to be talking about is just how innovation works, particularly in a digital era, because you have to innovate both for the current environment you have to innovate for the future. And then the other thing that I think is particularly important is you have to figure out how to avoid becoming complacent and stagnant, which is where every company in the history of the world has eventually ended up. Amazon hasn't gotten there yet. Um, you know, Statistically, it probably will happen at some point, but it hasn't happened yet. Uh, John, uh, welcome to the show and introduce yourself a little bit. Doug, thanks for having me. So John Rossman, I'm a former Amazon executive. So I helped help launch the marketplace business and I ran enterprise services at Amazon. I left Amazon in late 2005, working with my clients on digital strategy, digital transformation. Along the way, one of them at the Gates Foundation said, hey, you should write a book because you do a nice job of kind of putting all these little strategies and mechanisms. Uh, And so um, I wrote the Amazon way about the Amazon leadership principles. I wrote a book called Think Like Amazon, 50 and a Half Ideas to Become a Digital Leader. That's the full playbook of every mechanism from Amazon. And I wrote a book about the internet of things called the Amazon way on IoT. Um, I think Amazon is the most interesting company of the digital era, and it's not because of what they do, it's because of how they do it. And I think those mechanisms, those concepts, those strategies are things we can all learn from. And so I always say like, hey, this discussion, it isn't about Amazon, it's about what you can take from a company like Amazon to both operate better for today, as well as think about how to innovate for the future. Got it. Got it. Okay. Well, uh, share a couple of those nuggets with us. I mean, because, um, you know, the, you know, at at least in my observation, because, you know, my, in my career, right, you know, I worked at Intel for almost 18 years and then I moved, you know, in the tech sector, I was in finance there. And then I moved over to Lattice Semiconductor, which is also in the tech sector, much smaller semiconductor company um, too. But there's a pretty common repeating pattern in a lot of these companies, particularly technology companies, but, you know, in a lot of companies, which is where, you know, you'll kind of start out, you'll have this really fast growth phase. And when things are growing, uh, they, people will lose track of details and things will be become an enormous mess. And then eventually there will be a big scramble to pick it, to try to pick things up. And it may or may not succeed. Usually it doesn't. And then somebody will get fired because they didn't manage the transition, right? Then a new person will get brought in. And they'll try to create immediate results. And so they'll take shortcuts and eventually there'll be another mess and then they'll get fired. And then that, it, what happens is that growth cycle just kind of stalls out. Yeah. So- now, the thing that's unique about Amazon is that it doesn't really seem to have hit that stall out point. I mean, and now inevitably at some point that is going to happen because it's just gravity. But I still think that the run that Amazon has gone on, you know, and again, this isn't to be an Amazon fanboy per se, but just Amazon as an example, the uh, the degree with which they've been able to scale without hitting that phenomenon that just infects so many companies, uh, I, I think is really interesting and is really worth studying. Um, you know, because of course, right? You know, I'm not prone to conspiracy theories, but of course, right? There's the uh, you know, there's the Jeff Bezos evil emperor conspiracy theory. Um, you know, I, I, I you know, I, I happen to think he's more of just a hyper goal oriented kind of guy. Uh, and you know, if you if you press hard enough, you're going to make you're going to hack people off. But so that may be the longest question I've ever been asked. <laughs> so you 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 packed in a lot in there. So let me uh, try to address several elements along the way. The first is you know kind of this premise that like every company does go through this life uh, cycle, yeah. and Be- Bezos himself has has said. Um, Every company dies. Amazon will at some point be disrupted. I'm just trying to make it so it's not in my lifetime. And so I think it really starts with the humbleness and the recognition that if we don't continue to figure out how to grow and how to reinvent two slightly different perspectives there, um, that inevitability will will hit us, right? Yeah. Um, So that's that's one thing. The second thing is really... um, 
how to use customers, not just as a tactical vehicle of like, hey, we have to satisfy today's customer with today's products and services, but being truly curious about the job your customer is trying to get done. Like what's the real outcome and what sucks about how they go have to go about their day to day and figuring out the little ways that you can expand and serve those. Truly, I believe Amazon's now like call it 27 year history has been understanding customers and how yeah. do we how do we slowly and incrementally serve them in bigger and broader ways? And that's both external customers as well as internal customers. So for example, when I was at Amazon, uh, we were uh, 90% of the book business was books, music, video, right? Yeah. Um, and we leveraged the business. I launched the marketplace to expand into 14 more categories. And we had the patience to allow customers to figure out like, oh, hey, I go to Amazon for more than just books, music, video. We allowed selection to catch up so that it was authoritative selection. Mm -hmm. We complemented it with uh, the prime membership and with this cool underlying service called FBA Fulfillment by Amazon, but we gave it patience. And I think one of the things um, leaders at big enterprises do is they don't understand when to have patience on a good idea to just let it catch up, let either whether it's the yeah. customer to catch up or markets. But the problem with big companies is being a big company and big P&Ls. And so one of the things you have to do is truly separate out your big cash cow, mature-ish uh, business lines from your small separate ideas, your bets, right? And you have mm -hmm. to if you, but what companies do is they line all these things up, they apportion appropriately, and those little things never get the oxygen, they never get the attention from leadership that they need to develop into big businesses. Yeah. When I was at well, Amazon in late 2004, we had a difficult holiday period. The website had all sorts of performance issues. At that point, every team, um, um, managed, uh, acquired, set up, was responsible for their own infrastructure. We came back and was like, this isn't going to scale. We need to create centralized uh, computing capability. But we said, we have to make it self-service. Let's force ourselves to have external customers for this so that we get critical feedback. And so we created the self-service infrastructure. We had to start external, to sound customers. Familiar. We, uh, external customers. And that's how Amazon developed into AWS. What gave Amazon in a book internet retail company the permission to completely reinvent the computing industry? Nothing other than our own curiosity, our yeah. own tenacity, and our own like, this isn't going to work for us long term. And so we were willing to do the hard work. Most companies aren't trying to think through what are the challenges and then generalizing solutions to those to serve broader audiences. So the last thing relative to your answer is there's no one answer uh, to any of this, right? I, I, I would simply boil it down to leadership and culture. And that's why I think the book I wrote, The Amazon Way, about Amazon's leadership principles and what you can take from them. I think it starts with that because if you can help get a broad based team set on, like, here's what we believe in, here's how we hold each other accountable, here's how we make decisions, here's how we orientate ourselves relative to the market, how we make investments, how we yeah. think about long term and short term. And it's not that Amazon's leadership principles are the right ones for you. It's that they've clearly articulated them. And they, while they're not perfect in any way, they try to put them into everyday situations, everyday jobs, right? They're not a poster on a wall. And if a company, if a leadership team can really step back and think through, like, how do we think about those topics and how do we create some durable perspectives, tenants, principles, whatever you want to call them, so that we're all on the same page, you're going to be a better operator, right? Um, and But most leadership teams, they don't go through that work to really slow down and think, essentially think about how you're thinking, right? Like that's what principles do. So that's 
those are my answers to uh, a, a nice, uh, a well stated but long uh, question. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say yes to the machine gun question. Um, and so I think there's a uh, uh, th there are a few nuggets you dropped in there that I'd like to address. Uh, the one uh, I talked about AWS, the thing at least that I think is unique about Amazon. Or and again, th this isn't meant to be a, an expose on Amazon. It's really using more Amazon as a case study for development of a company. Uh, but which is that Amazon was started on the fulfillment business, which is which the way Amazon operates it is best case of break even business. You know, fulfillment is not where you make money because the margins are so slim. However, the that fulfillment focus is what brought about. Amazon Web Services, which is the primary profit machine of Amazon, but that really, or at least that's what it is now. I'm sure you can give give us some more inside baseball, um, but you know, but I don't think that would have come about if there hadn't been that willingness to adapt, pivot, try, figure things out, fail, and then continue moving forward. Um, you know, kind of, you know, to, you know to, to tell me where the holes are in my analysis. Well, it, it, it really was from website scalability, not yeah. fulfillment scalability, uh, scalability that drove the invention yeah. of AWS. But that that's kind of neither, neither here nor yeah. there. It was from our own operational needs and then what we did, the, the magical thing we did was we said, A, it has to be self-service. So people need to be able to use it yeah. without talking to others. And B, let's have external customers to it, right? Yeah. And that's, that's really the strategy of what is called a platform company, right? You build capabilities that you'll use as well as others will use. Yeah. And that, if you think about how did Amazon get into being this, mm -hmm. this multi-sided truly conglomerate business, but it's a conglomerate business where all of these units actually have synergies together, yeah. right? Like they actually do operate together. It's because of that repeated pattern of, hey, there's something that doesn't work well for us, doesn't scale. We need more control. Hey, we'll make it self-service. Yeah. Hey, we'll have external customers. Even their fulfillment operations, they've done that same thing, right? So I mentioned fulfillment by Amazon. FBA, yeah, yeah. That is creating a platform strategy, um, that's fulfillment as a service. They've done that across the board with so many capabilities. Um, and so, you know, that willingness, but what that takes is it takes, I mentioned kind of patience, but, you know, patience also equals investment, right? And so it's about long-term enterprise value creation versus short-term results. And short-termism, meaning like, focusing on just delivering this year, this quarter, this week's results, that's important, but it can't be at the cost of long-term um, approaches. So there's lots of tools and mechanisms to think that through, right? Like there's, there's clearly understanding uh, your p &L and and how to drive profitability in today's business and separating out the investments that we're making into scaling or future businesses and being able to tell that story. One of the things Amazon did so well was they've like read their, their first um, shareholder letter, 1997 shareholder yeah. letter. They tell you exactly how they're going to operate and how they're going to invest long-term. And please don't invest in the stock if you don't believe in these things. They have been such strategic communicators relative internally and externally to the game that they're playing. And that's how they've gotten to be, you know, essentially a $500 billion company that's still growing at over 20% a year. You don't see those, I don't think any company yeah. of that size continues to have those types of growth dynamics. And they're continuing to expand, not just in scaling existing businesses, but planting those seeds for the big dreamy businesses of tomorrow. Yeah, well, and I think that uh, one of the things that you you just touched on that I'd like to unpack a little more, which is which I think is probably, I mean, yeah, you know, I know there's uh, people have a lot of opinions about uh, Jeff Bezos, but I think one of the things that he really really uh, contributed to Amazon was the long term focus and the complete unwillingness to sacrifice the long term to meet short term objectives, and he set that expectation with shareholders and really stuck to it because, of course, you know, it's like you said, there's the poster on the wall. Because like places I've worked, everybody has corporate values that look a lot 
that read a lot like Amazon leadership principles. It read just like everybody else's values. Everybody else says they're long-term focused. But what it really comes down to is, okay, what do you fund? What's in the budget? Uh, because you know, it's not. I, I always say it's not what you say; it's what you fund. Uh, because money's what really talks. Uh, you know, if you're, you know, when, when you're in the corporate all hands, okay, yeah, yeah. I really don't care about anything someone says in the all hands. I want to know where where the where the money's going because that's what tells you what they really care about. Um, and I think that that focus is really one of the one of many things that's enabled Amazon to be so competitive. Uh, but one thing I'd like to get your view on is. Okay, you know, let's say that we have a listener who is in an executive capacity, but they're, you know, they're trying to influence a company, say that is, you know, that that's what you would call more of a quote standard company, or that say doesn't have access to as much investor capital as Amazon. Because mm-hmm. Amazon was very fortunate in that it's been an investor darling for a long time and has had a capital. I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna stop I'm gonna stop you there. Like okay. that, you you remember the last 11, 12 years. What you don't remember is from 2000 to 2009, when the stock was flat, it was between five and $30. Actually, you're we, right. I do we, remember we, that. We, we were called <laughs> Amazon.com, Amazon.toast, Amazon.com, Amazon.org. Yep. Bezos and team had the same values, the yeah. same orientations. That's really when these things were were, were fired and, and baked into the DNA. And it's when you can be, when people are doubting you, but mm-hmm. you're looking at your business like, I believe in this business, I believe in the long-term, and you continue with those values. That's when you've really uh, struck something. And you know, All right, he took you to me, school. Let, let's unpack that a little more because I think to me that well, no, that's go, go, the go back, go, 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 go back to your go back to your initial question. But I just wanted to correct you. You yeah. know, when 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 I was at Amazon, we had uh, it, we had our first billion dollar quarter in holiday two thousand two. So today it's a roughly five hundred billion dollar revenue company. Had our first billion dollar quarter, yeah. um, and we only had a uh, billion dollar. Uh, in short-term assets, right? Between cash and receivables, yeah. you know, and everything, right? So there was nothing uh, confident uh, yeah. or, or or solid. And so I just, you, you know, you, you said like, hey, we've always been an investor darling and we always had all of this. It was like, that is not true uh, at all. And they continue to be, you know, frugality is one of the leadership principles and they continue to le- le- live that leadership principle today. And that just means invest like and spend money like it's your own money. And they drive that as an organizational principle. Yeah. It ties back to being humble, right? Humble yeah. organizations, humble leaders are careful with their resources. And so they, they don't think or act like, you know, the, the, the spoiled, you know, rich kid and rich company today. And that's one of the things that helps keep that culture alive is, you know, they continue to put constraints on the business and constraints force you to innovate. Right. And there's lots Mm -hmm. of different types of constraints. Cost and budget is just one of them, but they continue to, to, to try to squeeze out as much as they can. And they do not act like a a resource rich uh, organization, and that's uh, that that's fair. And uh, yeah, I, I I am guilty of having a uh, short term hindsight bias because because yes, you're right. There, the 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 investor capital has been uh, plentiful in the last ten years, but it was sparse for about a good eight nine years uh, between the the tech wreck and the financial crisis. So back, what, what, uh, t- what was your initial question? Okay, then? Yeah, yeah. So yes, the the uh, the initial question, which I think the uh, our recent dialogue is a good lead up to. The initial question is: Okay, let's say that we're talking about talking with a you know talking to a listener who is a leader, say let's say in a mid sized company, and they're trying to figure out: Okay, you know I. I'm trying to implement some of these Amazon principles to improve my company under intense resource constraints. What do I do? What's my, you know, what, you know, what is my next best, my, my best next step? Yeah. So, so um, there's, there's 16 leadership principles. You really have to understand the right ones to kind of pull at the right moment. 
Um, leadership principle number three is invent and simplify. I think the most interesting part of that leadership principle isn't the invent piece, it's the simplify piece. And what happens so often in any size of organization, any industry is complexity yeah. builds <laughs> up, right? Yeah. Um, and that means work complexity, policy complexity, data po complexity, systems complexity, customer experience complexity, cost center complexity, it all gets complex. And that it hides accountability, it hides costs, it hides true profitability, it hides true growth opportunities. So figuring out how do you simplify along processes, along organization, along data, along products uh, and, and services is I think a real unlock, especially when you, you, you don't have necessarily that rich, you don't have a lot of patience, you need fast results and you need, you need the investments to pay back really quickly. Look yeah. at the simplicity across your organization because when you start simplifying things, um, not only will customers be happier, money starts falling to the floor yeah. uh, and everything. And so it pays back immediately. The other thing, and one of the leadership principles is, um, leaders pay attention to details. And so understanding how to put metrics, instrumentation, monitoring into everything that's going on, both the customer experience as well as operations, and then find out where those inefficiencies are, that's become, that is a yeah. digital mindset, right? And everything, right? How do we use sensors and data and monitoring to drive continuous improvement to the next level? Every organization can, can, that's why it's called continuous improvement, can take it to the, to, to, to the next level. But so many companies, they get complacent, even yeah. relative to current operational models. None of that is about long-term investment, about you know, uh, long-term uh, innovation or anything. That's just about optimizing in today's business and can really help you pay, pay for future investments, deliver those results you need today, and you build a culture and a capability. It's like, oh, now I start to get to understand like what true accountability means, how to scale a business, how to continuously improve, how to be more uh, obsessive about the true customer experience. And you can build on those things into in innovation. Yeah, that's, that's excellent. I, I really like that. I really like the idea of a focus on simplicity because I think I've had similar observations, uh, you know, in the finance and technology piece, because I've noticed that uh, you know, enterprise data systems I've seen are just get horribly complicated. Um, you know, and of course, the, the uh, you know, the reason why the systems get horribly complicated is because the business processes are horribly complicated. That's right. And, that's right. And, and with, and what, you know, I, I, what every single deployment I've ever seen, the way that it works is there'll be this weird, goofy, complicated business process. And then management says, okay, make the system match the process. And so we go, we go okay, well, we're going to have to, uh, we're going to have to dramatically customize it. I don't care, just do it. And then, then what happens is, you know, after about, you know, after five or six time and time delays and budget overruns, I'll say, why is this thing so expensive? Why is it taking so long? Why is it so hard to use? Why is it so complicated? It's like, it's because you didn't simplify in the first place. That, that's right. And you're not willing to do the hard things of kind of simplifying rationalizing. is hard. It is it, so it, hard. It is hard. And, and oftentimes you have to, you know, kind of uh, step on people's feet, right? You have to say like, hey, we're not going to do it this way anymore, or we're going to change our structure. Or we're going to change jobs, you know, and everything. Right. And it's when you're not willing to do the hard things that the market yeah. demands that the business really demands because you're uncomfortable with that change. That's, that's, you know, that is the, that is poor leadership uh, in its essence because you are not being a steward for tomorrow's business. Yeah, no, I, I totally hear you. Totally hear you. Um, okay. Well, let's see. So I think we're, we're getting close on time, but I don't want, <laughs> don't want to cut us short. I give us two or who are, uh, sorry, two or three nuggets of wisdom to take home with us. And then uh, let us know where people can learn a little more about, uh, about you, your business, find your book, et cetera. Sure. So, you know, one of the 
great ideas from Amazon is for every principle you have or, or kind of tenant belief you have, you have to have mechanisms in order to, to enact that, right? And so a mechanism yeah. is a technique, it's an action, it's something you do that actually demonstrates and helps build up. Um, one of the habits that Amazon has is around this habit of writing. So whether it's writing out what your plan is, what your correction of error is, how you're going to improve this process, or what your future great idea is, Amazon, right, they, they have these technique of kind of writing future press releases, writing narratives, writing FAQs, and then teams debate them, they read them, they get clarity about either the situation, what their actions are going to be, or, or what the future is going to be. And that's how they communicate so much better and think things through so much better than I've seen most organizations do. So that's one of the, I think, killer habits. I talk about it in the book about writing things out and creating this culture of writing is, I think, one of the nuggets. Um, way people can reach me. And a culture of writing also means a culture of reading because you know if you if you write a write a white paper because I've read this which is where of course yeah you know, I've never actually seen it which is one one, one of the I'm not going to say things on my bucket list but one of the things I'd be interested to see is a a meeting where people everybody brings in their different white papers on the subject yeah. and you read and everybody reads through all of the, and all then the different you, papers and then for you, the first thirty minutes. And then you debate it and then you iterate. And the great thing about this technique is it scales. You can do it as just an individual. You can do it as a team. You yeah. can do it as a line of business. You can do it as the entire enterprise, right? Like it doesn't have to be this all in concept yeah. from the beginning. And that's how real change can happen. Gotcha. So I can be reached at LinkedIn, John Rossman. Uh, my website, rossmanpartners.com. Uh, the Amazon way is at Amazon. It's available in Kindle, paperback, and Audible. And I, I have a newsletter, a weekly newsletter. It's free. It's called the Digital Leader Newsletter. You can find yep. it on Hub, Substack. So uh, I'm fairly easy to get a hold of. Outstanding. Outstanding. Well, John, we really appreciate your time today. And I uh, hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Doug, great job. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for listening to the Terminal Value Podcast. Please feel free to visit me online at www.terminalvalue.biz where you can subscribe, find me on social, and then we can connect and just keep the conversation going. I'm really looking forward to hearing from you and I hope you have a wonderful day. All rights reserved. No part of this broadcast may be produced in any form by any means without written permission from Business of Light, LLC. All trademarks and brands referred to herein are the property of their respective owners.